all of you with us today. Great to be with you. And when I say good morning, you know, I can hear things in the back. So I'm not always just saying, hey, this is a greeting. May you have a good morning. But like, this feels like a good morning. Yeah, it's a good thing. I love starting out this way. Well, listen, I want to tell you a little bit about my history. So it's a more of a, a somber note to, to start on, uh, but a little bit about some things that have happened in, in my family and just how the Lord's grown me to, to where I am today. So some of you here, just because I grew up around here, some of you here knew my older sister. Her name was Ryan, which I know is a very strange thing to have a sister named Ryan, uh, but nonetheless, that was her name. Uh, my, my parents always said if, they, if she had been a boy, they would have named her Jacob, but because she was a girl, it was Ryan, right? It's just strange things. Uh, but anyway, so back in 2019, she had been sick for a while, 2019, February 2019, she passed away from a brain tumor. Uh, friends with some folks here as well. And, and just for my, my own individual household, it, it, this had already been a really difficult and trying time for us that we were walking through. And this, of course, was the worst part of all of it. Within a couple of months of her memorial, we were living in Chattanooga at the time. We flew out to San Antonio, spending some time with some uh, family out there, I think for like my nephew's graduation or something. And, and we were flying back in and we're on the plane. We're, we're about to deplane uh, back in Chattanooga. Now, as we're on the plane, as we're, you know, just kind of in the airport, those kind of things, we're a couple months beyond. We, we weren't talking about, like Judith and I, my wife, we weren't talking about Ryan. We weren't talking about my other sister. So my other sister had actually passed away eight years earlier. And we, we had had, we'd had no conversation really about them or anything that was happening. But as we're getting off the plane, you know, kind of how we're toward the back and, and you know how the, the plane, the, the aisle kind of gets crowded and this woman just kind of fights her way backwards because because who does that, right? But I mean, she fights her way backward to me and she just says, I, I don't know where this is coming from. I feel like maybe the, the Holy Spirit is telling me to just, your sister is at peace and with Jesus. I, that's, I, had, I had nothing to say. I was like, thank you. I mean, there was just nothing else that came to my mind. And so after a minute, like, I, I kind of gathered my thoughts and I found her and I, and I kind of called her up on the story and thanked her for sharing that. It was like, well, here's what happened. And she's like, I had no idea. You know, she, she didn't know what was going on. But what I can tell you is I was so incredibly encouraged and thankful and, and just at peace. Shalom. Like just things were right in right relationship. I, I didn't know why this happened. I, but, but what I did know is that in that moment, I knew God cared for me. And, and I knew that God was with me. So does prophecy still exist today? If we look at this passage, it's not just about prophecy. It also talks a lot about tongues. Does tongues still exist today? Is anyone feeling a little bit uncomfortable just with asking these questions and thinking about it? Because, I mean, it's, it's okay. You can feel uncomfortable because th these can be some controversial things. I'm the guy preaching this who's been studying this for several weeks, and I'm a little bit uncomfortable myself because there are different viewpoints out there. Not everybody sees it the same way. And most of those viewpoints, they come from people who love Jesus. They love Jesus, and they believe that the Bible is God's inerrant, absolutely accurate word, and yet they still come to some different conclusions, or they disagree on maybe the, the understanding of some of the terms or, or how you're supposed to translate them. And so when we, we don't fully understand the context or, or the terminology, we can disagree on those things and that's okay, but it can lead to controversy. And so my desire for us today is that we're going to be able to have a better understanding of these gifts and maybe an understanding of some other people and different views, but also What's their proper use? What, what's their value? And why all Christians have gifts in general. And so today, here's what we're going to see. We're going to see that love is why we're empowered to encourage others orderly and eagerly. So let's pray as we dive into this. Well, Father, exactly what, what I'm, I'm saying we're going to be able to see here, that's what we're asking you. So we invite you, Lord, the Holy Spirit, to just guide our time here today. 
God, the words that I say, I pray they're coming from your word, from your Holy Spirit. I believe that you've been here in the preparation already, and you've prepared hearts out here to receive your word. And so I just pray that whatever I say, it's, it's from you, anything else is forgotten, but that the people here will hear the message that you have for them today myself included, that we would go and live and use our gifts to build up your church, your bride. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so love is why we're empowered to encourage others orderly and eagerly. So let's break this down just a little bit at a time to understand. We're going to start with love is why we are empowered. And we're going back to the same place we ended last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1 starts with pursue love. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and especially that you may prophesy. Now, Sean started this out a few weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 14, and what is the fourth part of our 1 Corinthians series? Uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and he was talking about spiritual gifts and kind of the point of spiritual gifts to build up the body of Christ, that we all have them to contribute. And so then he got into the next week, last week, 1 Corinthians 13, which talks about really the point of those spiritual gifts even in more detail, which is love. The love is why. Pursue love. But in Corinth, they weren't always being very loving with their gifts and the way they were using their gifts. They made their gifts a bit of a competition. Do we have competitive people here? Raise your hand if your spouse is competitive. Yeah, I I thought it might go that way, right? They had some competition that was going on with folks. They kind of saw a little bit of a hierarchy of the gifts. And so when the church gathered, it got kind of chaotic as as people kind of, they were were fighting for attention and they were fighting for the spotlight. If y'all were here last week, I don't know, got to see online last week. I don't know if you noticed that Sean was up here and while exercising his spiritual gift, he said, you know, spiritual gifts are not to be exercised in the spotlight, and he was literally standing in the spotlight. It was a wonderful thing, uh, but not, that's not the purpose for him, of course. He's, he is a humble man with all of it. It is wonderful. But they were fighting for attention. They're fighting for the spotlight, and tongues seemed to be the gift that the Corinthians, the church of Corinth, really wanted. They thought that was something really unique and special. And we ended last week with the first part of this verse, seeing that love is the why behind all of the gifts. That your gift is not for building you up, although it can be that. Your gift is primarily to help you pursue love, to love one another. So if you look to your left, you look to your right, look forward, you look backward. Those are the people your gift is for. Your gift is for building up the church, for helping people find and follow Jesus. So love is why we should desire spiritual gifts, not for notoriety, not for attention, not for anything else. It's it's to love God and to love people, to build up his bride, the church. But then Paul goes in, he ends up emphasizing a particular spiritual gift. And why is this one so important? He's talking about prophecy. Is Is it still so important today? So let's take a, little, take a look at this just a little, little bit at a time. What is prophecy and does it still exist today? And so we have to answer the first part of that question if we're going to answer the second. Now, there are some different views on what Paul is talking about with prophecy in here, that, especially that you may prophesy, that you would desire prophecy. And so some people think that what Paul is talking about is like Old Testament prophecy, that the prophets would go out and proclaim God's word. And this this is the word from God that would become scripture. If so, if that's what this prophecy is, it comes with the same test as the Old Testament test of prophecy, which is get it right or die. I mean, that's truly it. That's that's how it's written. That's, That's what you do with prophecy in the Old Testament. If a prophet got something wrong, you're supposed to stone them. Now, how many of you are going to, with that test, go out and say, hey, the Lord told me to say this to you today? (laughs) You get that wrong. That's that's kind of a high mark there, right? Now, later in this chapter, Paul's going to tell people to test prophecy, but he doesn't go on and say, okay, now test in the church, let the elders come together in the church and test what the prophet is saying, and then if they get it wrong, stone them. If you all know what's coming up in the rest of this chapter that I'm about to speak, there's a chance I'm going to get some things wrong this morning, honestly. And if we're going with that test, that means the elders need to come in and stone me. 
Let's not do this, <laughs> right? I don't want that. So I don't think that's what he's talking about, but, but he does, it, it seems like he's expecting someone to be wrong. And so he gives instructions on when it's okay for, for prophecy. And he tells people to be quiet until it's their turn. Like, here's when you can prophesy. And he says, keep it orderly, one at a time. And, and if it's not your turn, be silent. Can you imagine, if he's talking about Old Testament prophecy, can you imagine someone going up to Isaiah, the prophet, who's like in the synagogue, in the temple, and he's giving God's message, like, Isaiah, Isaiah, I want to speak, be quiet. Or Isaiah, the prophet, comes up and he says, I have a message from God. You're like, hold on, I'm talking right now. Right? You don't do that. So this is, that's not the kind of prophecy that we're talking about here. You don't tell an Old Testament prophet to get in line, wait your turn. So what he's talking about here, it's, it's more like a sense from the Holy Spirit. Understand that we're in a new age now, a new era of the church where we are as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And so it's a little bit more of that kind of sense. And it can feel like kind of a, a gut feeling. Here's the key though. It is not authoritative like scripture right? Scripture is its own thing. The Bible is complete. There is no more revelation like it. There is no more to come. So this prophecy that we're talking about, that Paul's talking about here, is always submissive to Scripture. John Bloom, I think, says it really well to help us understand it. He says, prophecy is not Scripture's comp uh, competitor, but it's prescription. Prophecy is a means of applying scripture to someone's life more directly, helping them perhaps to see something they didn't see in it right away. So how does that work now? Well, sometimes when I've preached, someone gets something that I didn't necessarily intend with the message. It, it's fitting. It comes, it, you know, it comes from the passage we're talking about, but it's not something I planned or intended or felt the Holy Spirit leading me to say necessarily. And yet the Holy Spirit is speaking a message through me. John Piper was a famous preacher. He's retired now, but still preaching around in different places. But he is known for praying before every sermon that the Holy Spirit will speak a message through him to somebody that is just exactly what they need to hear at the moment. Sometimes it would be an alteration of what he was going to say. Sometimes it would just go through what he was already planning. In my experience, it's, it's more like, like an urge to share a message with someone even without knowing why. Or someone just kind of comes to mind. A couple of weeks ago, Jacob, he's the big guy that stands out here and leads worship. He, he felt the urge to, to text me just to say, hey, man, I really appreciate you. I really enjoy working with you. And let me tell you, it, it couldn't have come at a better time. I'd had a rough day relationally. I was kind of feeling down, a little bit discouraged. And that just helped to pick me right back up. The Holy Spirit, I mean, Jacob didn't know what he was doing. He just felt the need to send a text, and he did. And the Holy Spirit worked in my life. Now, like with any other kind of gift, with anything we get, there are going to be people who abuse the gift. And yet, so uh, there are false teachers that exist. We see that in Scripture. False teachers exist today. Does that mean that teaching is not a gift of the Spirit to be used anymore? No, people will use it incorrectly, but we don't eliminate the gift. Now, whatever someone says, including the things that I am speaking to you right now, that has to be judged against Scripture because God is not going to contradict himself. And so this means that we have to be humble in prophecy or any gift we're exercising, willing to admit, hey, you know what, maybe I got it wrong. Because we as people, we are marred by sin. We still struggle with sin. It's still there around us. We're surrounded by sin. And there's an enemy who can speak falsehood around us. And we're going to talk about some tests for prophecy in a minute to help us discern any leading we might have. But we've got to be really careful about ever, and I would say just don't even say this, but about ever saying to somebody, hey, God told me. We've got to say, stay humble, have some humility. A year or two back, I don't remember exactly how far it was, I kind of got this, this sense, this understanding, kind of a concern for a friend's relationship with a woman who was not his wife, that maybe it was starting to or leading to going too far, not that it already had, that didn't come at all. I wasn't sure. But, but I knew that his marriage had gone through a little bit of a rough spot, and I knew that these two, they had dated back in high school, and, and I love this guy. You know, he was one of my dear friends, has meant a lot to my life, and he still does. Um, 
And same thing, like I love his wife and I, and I love this other woman. I knew all of them. And, and I had no real evidence. Like there was nothing to go on. I just, I kind of had this, this feeling as we were interacting, that maybe there's something going wrong. And, and I thought it was worth being sure. And so I asked him, I said, hey, is there anything going on here that, that shouldn't be? And initially he was offended that I had even thought it was a possibility. And we talked about it and, and just kind of, he denied that there was anything happening there, which I'm like, yeah, that's kind of what I was hoping, what I was expecting. That's great. And we talked about the offense. Like, listen, man, it's, it's, we understand. We came to this conclusion. We're all good now. Like, it's, it's better to say something and, and approach that with humility and, and hoping it's not right than to just let it go and nobody does anything about it. And so we're all good, but, but I was wrong. And yeah, sure, okay, because some may be thinking, okay, but what if he was lying? Maybe he was, but I'll tell you what, there is not much of anybody I can think of that I trust more than this guy. I mean, I trust him implicitly, and I believe he would have told me, he shared things about his life with me and I with him that like, we hold nothing back. And maybe, you know, it is possible that just by sharing that message with him or that concern with him, that it put the thought in his mind, a little bit of a warning to, hey, watch out in case something does happen, just to kind of put it on his radar to guard his heart a little bit more. It's a possibility. You know what else is possible? That's just wrong. I don't know. And I realize that the way I'm talking right now makes it sound like prophecy is this normal kind of thing, that everybody's walking around doing this prophecy and speaking into each other's lives, and at some levels, maybe, but it's, it's really, it's been a lot more exceptional in my experience. Like that, that experience in the air, airport, that was a one-time thing. But in Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus says, we live by his infallible scripture. Paul tells Timothy, his disciple, he says, scripture is God-breathed. So the Bible is, that's the normative thing. Like if you want to hear God speaking to you, you go to God's word. You be in prayer with him. You listen to him. But the Bible is where we're regularly, constantly finding everything that prophecy might offer. It has everything we need. What prophecy is doing is simply, it's, it's pointing us back to the Bible when we're struggling to see what we need from it on our own. So why is Paul singling out prophecy? Here's why. It's because love is why we're empowered to encourage others. That's the point here about prophecy. So let's carry on in the passage here. For the person who speaks in a tongue is not speaking to people, but to God. Since no one understands him, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. Now, we're, we're going to come back to that in just a minute, those three things. But he says, what then, brothers and sisters, where, whenever you come together, each one, and I want you to hang on to this part, brothers and sisters, each one, okay? That will be important in a minute. Each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is to be done for building up. That means everything, all things. So see, prophecy isn't really the, the main focus. Paul is not like comparing prophecy to all spiritual gifts. He's speaking into a specific situation in Corinth, in that church. There was a bit of contention that was happening in there. And where there's contention, there tends to be pride. And, but here, it's between prophecy and tongues. See, people thought that tongues was some particularly special gift because it's a gift that's really easy to see. And it had happened at the day of Pentecost, and it was this kind of big deal, and, and they wanted that gift. But here's the thing. When the focus is the gift and not the gospel, you've missed the point. That's any gift. That's, that's any of them. Whatever your gift is, it's not about you, right? Do you hear me there? It's not, your gift is not about you. It's not about getting attention. And if we expect others to have our same gifting, we're forgetting everything that Paul said that we looked at a couple of weeks ago when he talks about the body, when he talks about us being a body as the church where we all have these different gifts. Now, if we look in deeper into how Paul is comparing tongues and prophecy, it tells us more about the point of these gifts as well as any other gift. And we've already taken a look into prophecy and how that works. We need to understand tongues, kind of the other side here, to get a better look at the whole picture. 
And, and I, I believe Paul makes it pretty easy to see what he's referring to because he quotes this Old Testament prophecy that, that really states the whole point pretty clearly about what tongues is. And so this is coming from Isaiah 28, 11. It, it's written in the law. This is what Paul's quoting here. I will speak to this people by people of other tongues and by the lips of foreigners. Okay? And even then they won't listen to me, says the Lord. So tongues as a gift, it's pretty simple. It's communicating in an unknown language. It's what happened on Pentecost, the day of, that the Holy Spirit first came upon the entire church. You find that back in Acts chapter 2. Now, we don't have time to read the whole thing right now, but what was happening there is people gathered from all over the Roman Empire, which was the, basically the entire world at that point from what people knew. And the message of the gospel is spoken. And, and on all of these people, though, they said, we're hearing this in our own native language. One language spoken, multiple people understanding it. A lot of times people think that tongues is this kind of unintelligible, ecstatic speech, and that probably comes from some more modern experiences with it. But I haven't found any of those kind of examples in Scripture myself. There is mention of the tongues of angels. Some interpret that as kind of a prayer language. I know people who use that. But there are three main viewpoints when it comes to tongues. And it's really interesting. We have people on our staff from all three of these backgrounds right now. So there's the cessationist view, the Pentecostal view, and the charismatic view, if we want to kind of lump them together. There's nuance within each of those. And I took some time in preparing for the message to chat with each of those, except for myself. I, have, I come from that cessationist background. Sean talked about these a little bit last week as well. And I took some time to talk to the other folks and just kind of get a sense of how they grew up and what, what they learned. And so for my myself as the growing up cessationist, we, cessationists believe that the sign gifts or the more obviously miraculous gifts have completely stopped. They ceased when the Bible was finished. I was so cessationist growing up, like Jacob was out here talking about raising hands, like, no, 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 that has ceased too. You just keep those down at your side. You don't want to distract anybody. Put them up, people. It's good stuff, right? Now, Pentecostals, that's a good transition to Pentecostals, right? <laughs> Pentecostals believe that tongues, it's not only, that not only do they exist today, but in general, they'll say that all Christians receive the gift of more ecstatic tongues. Charismatics, kind of in, in between. Sometimes people equate those. They're not really the same, but they tend to believe that sign gifts do still exist, but they're not necessarily for every single person. Not everyone has them or any particular one of them, and that would include tongues. But you want to know something really special about what's happened with the folks on our staff here? Despite three very different backgrounds, we've all come to the same basic point. We talk about it in different ways, but it's the same basic understanding. That although we experience it differently, we would all say that tongues and a lot of the other gifts, we'd say they continue, but with caution. And Sean talked about that with some of them in particular a few weeks ago. But what we're saying is they're not all necessarily normative. And so with tongues, each one of us would say we are, we are open to it, but we're not expected of it. For myself, for our person from the charismatic background on staff, we're open. Neither one of us has experienced the gift of tongues. The one who uh, was raised Pentecostal, really interesting, she wanted the gift of tongues. She thought she was supposed to have it, and it drove her crazy. And she kept pursuing it and just... It never happened. And then when she didn't get it, and then she quit worrying about it, and it started happening for her. And so she had kind of this prayer language that she will pray in. And every one of us, we, we all know people that we trust who, who have spoken in tongues, but, but we don't believe there's anything extra special about them because of it. So what's the bottom line with spiritual gifts? How do you know you're getting it right? Paul said it in verse 3. On the other hand, the person who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and consolation. That's it. We're given gifts to strengthen, encourage, and, and console one another. In verse 4, he says, they're for building up the church. So whatever your spiritual gift is, and by all means find out what it is or what they are, use it by the power of the Holy Spirit to glorify God by building up his church, by helping people to find and follow Jesus. But there is one more stipulation on here. See, love is why we're empowered to encourage others 
orderly. He writes in there, but everything is to be done decently and in order. And he goes on and explains it in a lot more detail in the remaining verses we won't take time to read. So this is something we work on here as a staff. Like I'm going through notes right now. I prepare this message ahead of time to keep from getting off track too much. I still do it some and it's fun for me, right? But, but we don't want to be a distraction. So every Tuesday, several of us, we get together to review the past Sunday and plan out the next few Sundays coming up. We look at the next service coming up. We plan that one out in a little or a lot more detail so that we're ready to go. Why? Order. Very simple. We want, we want there to be order. We don't want anyone distracted from the main point of that day and from helping people find and follow Jesus. So we limit the elements that we have in the service, like spotlighting a ministry that's happening or telling a, a life change story. We limit how many different things are happening so we can keep focused. We try to coordinate songs with the message, with the sermon and, and the content and in the field to help kind of center us and, and keep us kind of focused and heading in the right direction together. And there's, there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that like this screen and this screen and this screen and this screen, that these are all working together in sync to bring a cohesive message and feel and not distract anybody. You know, we don't want things jumping around too much and voices and instruments. We work hard on making sure that we get those mixes just right so we're all kind of brought together. So we've already talked about the gift of tongues then and now, and, and we know people have some different viewpoints on that, which is absolutely fine. I may not be right on this. It's okay. But if you take some time to read the rest of the chapter, what you're going to catch is there are definitely some rules for order within the church gatherings. And what we can say definitively is that if anyone is speaking in tongues, there shouldn't be too many of them, and there should be interpretation. It has to be orderly. If there is anyone, anyone to interpret, stay silent. We'll see this thing. Stay silent. Paul says that over and over. Keep it to yourself and God. It's similar with prophecy. Only two or three prophesy, one at a time. If someone else is speaking, like your parents teach you this, hopefully, right? If someone else is speaking, be silent. Wait your turn. That's how it goes. It's the same thing. And it's, by the way, this, this applies in the movie theater too, Okay. <laughs> Like, I don't need you to say, hey, oh, watch this part. That's the point of the movie. Like, that's why I'm watching. I'm going to watch the part. I, you, yeah. We were at prophecy, right? Let's get back to prophecy. Prophecy is supposed to be evaluated to make sure that it's in alignment with Scripture and encouragement, all the purposes of prophecy. And this leads to some more instructions on evaluating prophecy, which, honestly, this next couple of verses we're looking at, which is about prophecy, is something that's been taken out of context and honestly used to abuse and oppress people pretty often. Let's dive in. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but are submit to submit themselves as the law also says. We don't even know which law that's necessarily talking about. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, since it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate from you, or, or did it come for you only? There are some things that Paul writes, particularly all of Corinth, the Corinthian letters, where you're like, I don't really want to talk about that. Now, what we want to do today is I want to show you more about how the gift of tongues works. So I'm going to talk about this section in tongues. Jacob is going to come out and interpret <laughs> No, nah, not really. All right. So in those days, people would, you know, several people would speak within the church gathering. And what they said, as we've seen already, was supposed to be judged for proper doctrine, for biblical alignment. Clearly, women were included among those speaking. Remember what I showed you back in verse 26? It was talking about tongues and prophecy, and it said, each one of you. It said, brothers and sisters, each one, right? He's Paul commands them a few verses ahead of this. Speak in the church. 1 Corinthians 11, they are commanded, women are commanded to prophesy in chapter 11, to speak into people's lives. All right? Churches then, though, they, they were a lot smaller. Most of the churches were meeting in homes. They were founded in, they would either meet in a synagogue or in somebody's home, so they wouldn't be these really huge gatherings. They were more like our community groups, or really you know, slightly larger versions of our community groups or small groups that we have. Let me tell you about my community group. 
We meet in our home on Sunday evenings, and we have couples, and we have singles in our group. Each of those couples is balanced between introvert and extrovert, and it kind of goes, sometimes the wife is more extroverted, sometimes the husband. They all speak, sometimes one more than the other. There's no uh, kind of a set rhythm for how that works. But let me tell you very clearly, the women in my group, they speak. And they don't just speak, they contribute mightily. They're incredible. I'd even say they prophesy into my life. Now, I doubt they realize it or would necessarily say that just because we don't use that term a whole lot. But a woman a couple of weeks ago, she was just talking about some struggles she was having with her kids. And it matched some things that that we go through on our own. And oh my goodness, it was incredibly consoling, strengthening, and encouraging just for me as a dad. I mean, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me through her. Now, occasionally in churches, there are these kind of, you know, Supreme Court type of issues, issues of doctrine. And I'm not talking about even just like the the minor stuff, like the big issues of doctrine and dogma and, you know, church discipline. And those things things require a judgment. And that judgment, we find, belongs to the elders. We as a church, we believe, based in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 17, Titus 1, 5 through 9, that the elder role is designed for men. James talked about this a few weeks ago. James, one of our pastors here, not the apostle, James, whatever. Uh, But he covered that briefly a few weeks ago. I believe these verses are only referring to women being silent in kind of a main gathering, which is about major judgments, right? Where the actual judgment is being made. It doesn't mean, I don't think it means that they or anyone else have no voice. Talk about it at home. Go to the elders outside of kind of the time that they're talking and give them your input. Let them know what what the Lord may be laying on your heart if necessary. And you can even have a vibrant discussion as long as it's mutually respectful and loving, Listen, my wife, Judith, she has a doctorate of ministry. She has a lot of ministry experience. The woman is utterly brilliant. You better believe that if there are things going on in the church, I am going to get her opinion on those things. We talk about messages like, hey, what, are we tracking? Is this on point? And I listen to her. I get her opinion. We, I mean, she guides a lot of things I understand. But listen, too, I, I know we see these passages and And it can feel like the subordinate role is is like an assault on on your dignity. But we do all submit. Did you know that Jesus also took a subordinate role? And there was no point where Jesus considered it an assault on his dignity. Jesus and the Father, their relationship is the same as the husband and wife as compared to it. But for Jesus, and and I would say for anyone in this kind of subordination, as we use that word, his subordination is a sign of his greatness. It's a sign of his dignity, not his inferiority. And we may say, okay, yeah, but Jesus volunteered to do that. Absolutely. He sure did. And it's voluntary for you, too. This is not just for the women. This is the men and the women. It's a voluntary thing to submit to God's authority and to everything that he says. The Bible says that it's right to submit. And it says that just like it says a lot of other things are right. And we all have to choose if we're going to submit to what it says. It's our choice. Life goes a lot better if you do it. He offers something amazing if you do. And so what we find is that love is why we're empowered to encourage others orderly and eagerly. So let's take a look back at verse one. I want to see what Paul's doing here. So then, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, right? And we'll look back here then at verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. That's where Paul is beginning and where he's ending. Desire gifts, that's verse 1. Seek them, ask for them, be eager to have them, to use them. Get after it. Don't just let it happen. Right? Don't just say, ah, he'll bring it to me whenever. Go find it. Participate. Seek it. We should desire spiritual gifts in general. And what we're about to talk about applies to all spiritual gifts. Yes, Paul is talking about prophecy in particular, but I think it can apply to all of them. And see, when you really want something, you really want it. How far are you willing to go to get it? 
I mean, you just sit back and, eh, it'll come if, it, if I need it. You run after it, right? You get to work. How far are you willing to go? So this is what I suggest for all gifts, and especially for prophecy. The number one, you pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you about prophecy or about the gift. Ask him for it boldly and confidently because you have this verse here, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. And then he goes on to say, especially prophecy. Desire it. Ask him. Say, God, you told me to ask for this. Here, here I go. And then enlist some other people to pray for you. Then take some time to prepare. Pray. Prepare. Study it. Read 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, all of those, and really dig in to understand what the gifts are about and what they're for, how they work. And then go on, go back to Acts, read through the entire book of Acts, and you look for every time that gift is exercised, hear prophecy, look for where there are prophecies or visions, and, and look at those kind of messages that come out. Get some other resources. You can go to like desiringgod.org. It's a great place to find this. Type prophecy into the search there. Find a mentor, somebody who you see exercising a gift or who just you trust in general and talk to them about it. So pray, prepare, and practice. And this is the scary part. But God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. So don't fear. The best way to participate is, or to practice is with a mature individual Christian or group of Christians or a small group where you're kind of working all together on it. You're all doing this thing together because it's more forgiving that way because you all know you're growing and you're seeking this. People are more open to feedback, to learn and, and discern and to give you some feedback as well. And we would love to help you find one of those groups. You can check those out online or kind of go out in the foyer to the, the guest center out there. We'll get you in a group and you can start talking to people. But listen, God designed our brains to be attuned to him, to be in rhythm with his brain, with his mind, with who he is. And particularly, it's kind of this subconscious thing to, to be in that rhythm with the Lord. And so it takes some learning and some practice to be able to discern when you're really lining up with what God says, and it's always going to line up with Scripture. It's always going to be for strengthening, encouraging, and consoling others. And here's the deal. Jesus, he did all of this perfectly. He kept in rhythm with the Father. He spoke into people's lives what they needed to hear. And he spoke in a language people could understand that was meaningful to them. He sent the Holy Spirit to help authenticate the gospel message and spread it to those who spoke all kinds of languages. In fact, it says every language is going to hear. He even said that we're going to be better off with the, with the Holy Spirit than we are with him physically walking around with it because the Holy Spirit will inspire, will empower every one of us with spiritual gifts for the building up of the church to help people find and follow Jesus. Us, you, the Holy Spirit is God himself indwelling us, empowering us, speaking through us to others, speaking through others to us. And it's all meant to encourage, to strengthen, and to console one another. You want to be a part of that? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful just to take part in this, to give that to other people, to receive it from other people? It's all meant to encourage, to strengthen and console. And so now as we are entering into our time of communion, I want you to remember Jesus gave us this meal that we're about to take to remind us that we are here to build up the body, that we are a body sharing a meal together in Christ, to build one another up. And he made a way, which is you. As you open those elements, thank God for submitting even to suffer death so he could build you up. If you don't have those elements, just raise a hand. The ushers will bring those to you. And then, as you're thanking Jesus, ask the Holy Spirit what he has for you now to help people find and follow Jesus with the gifts that he's given you.